Good morning, Bill. Good morning. I have some questions for you about John H. Driscoll. I don't know very much about him or his family, uh, except for my grandfather. And I thought we'd start with a striking photo, in my opinion, of John H. Driscoll. Oh, yes. This was taken down, as far as we know, we've always said it was taken down at the beach of the beer. Mm -hmm. And that could not, I mean, that isn't uh, for sure. But you see the background there, it looks like we're being a hot the North Shore, and that would make sense because in looking at the photograph, probably taken, what, when he was 40, 50 years old, be the turn of the century, and your way to get to the beach would be by the Boston Elevator. Mm -hmm. So the Boston Elevator went out all the way to Revere Beach, so that would be my guess on it. Although later in life we know they spent a lot of time down in Cape Cod. But where did he live, though? Well, uh, Daddy, I can tell you, was born at number four, Unity Street, which is up there in that uh, picture that Eddie did years ago, mm -hmm. <clears throat> in the shadow of the Old North Church. Uh, I think, I think he lived with my grandmother in Chelsea. Although prior to that, they lived in Boston at Number Four Unity Street, which was really a ton of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Daddy's younger years were spent in Charlestown. And what, at what point did he move from being an infant at Number Four Unity Street? We know that to be a fact. When he moved over to Charlestown, I have no idea. So the Charlestown house was John H.'s house. Yeah, my grandfather, Daddy's father. Right. Your great grandfather. Yeah. 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 Okay. And he married Julia Crowley, and Sean could tell you, you know, what the dates were of that. I don't have them off the top of my head, but they had uh, seven children, the same as Daddy and Mother had, mm -hmm. and uh, the same amount. Five boys and two girls, just like my generation. Mm -hmm. And what did John H. Uh, do? Well, we know for a fact that he was, uh, let's see, you have a picture there, and we determined that this was taken, did, will this show up somehow? On the yeah, we'll put it on there. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but you can see. Uh, my grandfather, your great-grandfather, over on the far left, and he's obviously the guy in charge because he's the only guy with a bowl of hat. <laughs> <laughs> and 99% of them have mustaches and beards. There's a couple of clean-shaven guys. I don't know who they were. But they all look like they just stopped off the boat. Is this an Irish gang? It well, sure looks like it to me, and that would make sense, and we've determined it was the waterworks. And obviously, my grandfather worked his way up uh, in the waterworks, having gotten a job there, God knows how, but in those days, patronage was a big thing, of course, so mm -hmm. probably with connections through the Irish community, of which obviously the uh, Driscoll's belong. Uh, he probably, uh, you know, got hired by the uh, waterworks, probably as a laborer. I, I don't know that. And worked his way up to foreman. And worked his way up to being foreman, which is obviously from, uh, obvious from this picture. Uh, now we do have, uh, we uncovered it uh, when Alice died out of 6 Houston Street, some uh, wonderful memorabilia of him, and uh, strange enough, uh, you know, when we visited over there, when I visited as a kid, they never taught much about your grandfather. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, other than they referred to him as Pa, they called him Pa, and uh, 
But from this memorabilia that we, you know, got out of Alice's house, uh, our, among other things, was uh, some evidence that he was a painter mm -hmm. and sketchbooks that he had. And, and one of the sketchbooks indicated that he went to the Boston School of Writing, or some such thing. Mm -hmm. So the sort of, you know, when Eddie and I talked about it after we found those things, we figured he probably went to this Boston School of Writing or Printing, I forget the exact name of it, to uh, learn how to read and maybe make out blueprints, or, mm -hmm. you know, get some draftsman's ability. Mm -hmm. And that this might have been his path, you know, further education on mm -hmm. the line. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, at some point we could talk about the discovery of uh, some of his paintings. But well, we have one here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's Mulligan's Farm in uh, Revere. It's funny, we talked first about that being probably Revere. That's Revere? Mm-hmm. Well, it's on the back, and the way that we know that is on the back in his handwriting is John H. Driscoll, 1890, Mulligan's Farm, Revere, Massachusetts. And that was in his writing yeah. on the back. And along with that painting, which was downstairs in the basement at Alice's house at 6 Houston Street. It was wrapped in newspaper. And your cousin Sean discovered it when he was cleaning out the jelly closet in the basement. <laughs> and I can see him today with the, the dust cascading down as he took the stuff out of the so-called jelly closet. And at the same time found a big portfolio of uh, stuff that he'd done, and that's where this Boston School of Writing or whatever the proper mm -hmm. place came from. And in that was some sketches, a uh, sketchbook that he had. And Eddie went through that stuff later and came across a wonderful sketch that he had done in 1888. Mm -hmm. And you look at the sketch and you think, my God, I've seen that before, and of course it was the sketch of Mulligan's farm. Yep. Yeah, although not identified as such, but it's clearly the same as the one that he did the oil while. <clears throat> excuse me, two years later. Yep. And there it is. And that's a pencil drawing. That's a pencil drawing that was in his sketchbook, along with uh, some other sketches. And Eddie, nicely enough, what after he discovered that knew it belonged with a picture that really belongs to Sean, the oil. And so I had them both framed, well, Eddie did, I forget which. No, I, I framed the oil one and Eddie framed the, the sketch. So that's sort of, you know, what we know of, uh, of uh, your great-grandfather uh, as an aside at 6 Houston Street. There was a living room, and then there was a little study of it. And when we'd go into the study, I always went in there as a kid when we went over to visit at 6 Houston Street. And I'd go in uh, there because Will kept all his National Geographic. <laughs> and we'd go in and look at the National Geographic. <laughs> so my interest as in a kid of 8 or 9 or 10 or 11 or 12, somewhere in that area, was to see if there were any photographs of women from Africa. Right. They were not as, usually as well covered in their dress <laughs> as, <laughs> as the other pictures. Did other brothers go in with you? <laughs> or was it just oh, you, Bill? Well, I think I taught Robin <laughs> <laughs> to thumb through the magazines. <laughs> but the reason I bring it up is because the interesting thing was that beside the big sort of Morris chair that was in there, on one wall was a bookcase, and there was a shelf uh, on the bookcase, and that had some knickknacks that were there. And then hanging right beside it, between the bookcase and the, and the window, 
was a small sketch uh, uh, oil of apples. Mm -hmm. And I remember one day saying uh, to Alice, where did that come from? And she sort of dismissively said, oh, Pa did that. Mm -hmm. And no, no pride or, uh, uh, you know, willingness uh, to really discuss mm -hmm. her father. I don't think there was any bad feeling at all. It was yeah. just something you didn't talk about. It's the way they were. Yeah, it was yeah. the way they were. And Pa, evidently to them, uh, you know, was uh, quirky enough to do something like painting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you bring up his painting, and we've looked at it. Uh, Sean has pulled out a playbill from a play called Octoroon, and uh, apparently John H. Driscoll was also an actor. We found that out later on, and I forget just how that surfaced, but uh, in some of the, you know, the, uh, bear in mind, who lived at 6 Houston Street, originally were John, the oldest, we haven't gone through that generation, but there was John and May and Will and Walter and Alice, none of them married. Mm -hmm. The two that married at that point in time were Frank and Dad. Mm -hmm. So the five siblings bought together salary coming from the two girls, so-called, my Aunt May and Alice, who were school teachers. Yes. And John was in whatever business he was in, that he was a sales representative, a manufacturer's representative. Will was uh, a salesman for the Cottage Inc. Company and was there for well over 50 years, mm -hmm. a salesman for Cottage Inc. And Walter at that time was a bachelor, and he was a salesman at Feline's department store in the men's department. Mm -hmm. So their combined salaries, uh, you know, were more than enough to support them buying this lovely house at 6 Houston Street mm -hmm. in West Rock Street. And in that house, when Alice being the last one of that generation that lived there, Walter subsequently got married, so that's mm -hmm. where Walter and Marge come in and they had children over my cousins. And the house was full of memorabilia and stuff, and uh, Eddie, uh, Eddie was the recipient of a lot of the boxes of memorabilia and stuff, and it's a, my memory shows you that's when this surfaced. Mm -hmm. We never heard word one from Alice or anybody else uh, about uh, uh, Pa Driscoll's prodding the boards in mm -hmm. Boston. Mm -hmm. Obviously he did, and they saved some memorabilia of those days that he did. I don't recall if there's any date on those. There's not a date on this. On uh, that, but there may be on some of the other stuff. But this was Octoroon, or Life in Louisiana, is outlined, or uh, highlighted, with a Miss Susie Kluwer. Uh, and those were the two major actors and actresses in this, uh, in so this he, play. So he, he had a leading part. He had the leading part. Yeah. And uh, it's very interesting that it was of Southern lifestyle. Nothing to do with South Boston. <laughs> Nothing to do with South Boston. No. <laughs> now, you were talking about the family, and yeah. we, Sean has raised a wonderful photograph, and I have to admit that I can't identify anyone except my grandfather, Edgar J. the First. Your great grandfather. I can, oh, 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 John H., oh, my father, yeah, yeah. Your father, I can yeah. identify, but I can't identify the others. So if you could just look at this. Okay, it would be relatively easy. Uh, there is my grandfather and my grandmother, who was Julia Crowley. Mm -hmm. And then going by age, 
that would be the oldest, John, and I'm not sure of Will and May, but they were the next two in line. Mm -hmm. Whether you know, I'm not sure how that was. Next came Daddy, who's here, right? And then you have Walter, Alice, and Frank. So Alice was quite a bit younger than May. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, there was in between, there was Walter and uh, Daddy and maybe Will. Now, did May marry? No, Alice and May never married. Never married. Nor did Will or John. Frank did. Frank was uh, married after Daddy and Mother were married. Okay. He married Bessie Lowe. Have you ever heard of the Lowe? <laughs> <laughs> The reason you're laughing is because every time Eddie had anything to say about the family, I always traced it back to the Lobes. <laughs> the fact of the matter is we're never related to them, <laughs> although uh, Bessie's brother was Louis Lobe, who was a Jesuit priest, uh -huh. and he more or less, we always refer to him as uncle, and he was more or less the family chaplain. He married... Uh, Kathy and me, he married Sheila and Sandy and uh, Ricky and uh, Kay. Oh. So, uh, but we're never officially related to the Lokes. <laughs> now, what can you tell me about Julia Crowley? I'm afraid to say I'm uh, very sketchy on uh, okay. the Crowley end of it. She did have Uncle Tim was her brother. And the reason I remember Uncle Tim, of course I never knew my grandmother. Uh, she had died before? She died in the 20s somewhere. Uh, I, again, I, I So have, before you were born? Have, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Uncle Tim lived to be 185 or something. <laughs> he was ancient. And he was a lovely old guy. He was a bachelor, and what he did for a living, I don't know, but he had some business connection, mm -hmm. and another, uh, as I say, another bachelor, and stuck out in my memory as a kid, because when he had come to visit at 6 Houston Street, and we'd go over when Uncle Tim was there, he generally was good for a silver dollar. <laughs> he had slipped you a silver dollar. It's the first time I got it, I thought, this isn't really money. <laughs> and then found out that it was valuable. <laughs> it was worth a, a full buck. <laughs> but he, uh, he was an interesting dink and uh, very, uh, very uh, full of pep and vinegar uh, despite his age. And God knows how old he really was, right. uh, but he seemed to us totally ancient, and uh, because he was that next generation up, and uh, he lived in Roslindale, and he lived with his daughter Mary and her husband, and I think that name was McDevitt, Mary McDevitt. But Uncle Tim, you know, stayed there, and uh, as you went down to Rosendale, you passed by the house or whatever, so I guess it's Center Street. Mm -hmm. Trolley car would go from West Roxford down to Rosendale and then down to Forest Hills, you know, mm -hmm. on the L. And, uh, and long into his retirement, so he's probably in his late 80s or 90s, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He still went into town a couple of days a week, and he'd go to Tucker Anthony, which is a stock brokerage house, right. and he would be all dressed to the nines with a tie and a coat and mm -hmm. the whole business, and commute in by the Boston Elevator, and then he'd sit at Tucker Anthony and watch the ticker tape for <laughs> two or three hours and then take some lunch and then I guess go home for a nap. <laughs> the rest of the day was up for grabs. <laughs> At some point in time, I have no idea where it was, but 
by that time, Phil and Eileen had moved into Spruce Street in Devon. Yeah. And that was her mother and father's house. Oh, before. I didn't know that. Yeah. Huh. And Eileen and John, my uncle and I, right. had moved to Worthington Street. And so they left the house. Worthington Street in Devon? In Devon. Yeah. yeah. It was a lovely brick house that uh, John and Eileen had always admired. Mm -hmm. And it came on the market. And uh, at that time, their children were all gone and everything else. And they said, why not? We've always admired it. Let's do it. So they bought the Worthington Street house. Mm -hmm. And at that time, <clears throat> don't ask me what Phil and Eileen were doing. I guess Phil was probably either at Brandeis or later on he worked for the Boston Public Library. But at any rate, they moved into Spruce Street, into where she had been born and brought up. Yep. And the time of the story that relates to Uncle Tim was uh, they had, uh, I guess, all of their children, but it, Philip was. Philip will probably kill me if he ever sees this number of people. But Philip, I guess at the time, was eight or nine years old, or maybe a little bit younger, I'm not sure of the age. But uh, they were at the dinner table one night, and the phone rang. So Phil got up and answered. And being a one-sided conversation, I had him, oh, Daddy, and, oh, that's too bad. Oh, 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 that's too bad, Daddy. Yeah. Well, you let me know when uh, the service is going to be and anything we can do and so forth. And then hung up and he came back to the table. And of course, Eileen or something, everybody said, what was that all about? And he said, well, it's kind of sad because Uncle Tim just died. And Daddy was telling me that Uncle Tim had gone to this reward in the sky. And with that, Philip decided to go, oh, 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 and seemed to be destroyed by this news of his great great uncle Tim finally slipping away. And uh, so Phil took him away from the table and took him into the other room and sort of counseled him as fathers are supposed to do. And, you know, told him about the Lord giving and the Lord taking away and ashes to ashes and anything else that came into his mind. And Philip quickly composed himself, uh, was quite interested in what uh, his father had to say. And then he finished the conversation by saying, Tell you the truth, Dad, I didn't really know him. <laughs> <laughs> Philip will probably kill me for telling that story, but we howled when we heard it. <laughs> uh, one of the other things that I don't know and don't understand is whether uh, John H. came directly from Ireland or was he born here? No, he was, he was born here. And again, I don't have any notes to refer to, but Sean did a lot of work in tracing stuff back through, uh, you know, these uh, web programs you can get on mm -hmm. Ancestry and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And uh, I think he picked it up from the census of whatever year it was that uh, your great grandfather was born in Boston, but that he, and his father's name was Patrick, and his mother's name was... Ellen. 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 And so that would be my great-great-grandfather, your yeah, great-great-grand, great-great, whatever. I yeah. But anyway, uh, he had an older brother, at least one older brother, Mm -hmm. named Cornelius, mm -hmm. who was born in Ireland. Okay. So part of that generation was born in Ireland. Right. And part, including your great-grandfather, mm -hmm. was born in Boston. Okay. So, you know, that's a... That's and did the, whole, did the whole family come to America? Well, I mean, I Cornelius so. did. 
Yes, Cornelius came here, as did his mother and father, yeah. Patrick and Ellen. Yeah. And where they are buried, uh, or what, I, I, I don't have any knowledge at this okay. point. All right. Yeah. Don't know. Did you, uh, did you know uh, John well? Was he around oh, yeah. when you were a kid? Oh, yeah. Yeah. When we went over there as kids, uh, you might ask, when did they buy that house? And I just have to assume in the 30s. Uh-huh. Because they all lived in Roslindale before this on right. Walter Street. Um, well, uh, and we have pictures in the family archives somewhere of the family at Walter Street. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, they had all gone, where they were all upwardly mobile. Mm -hmm. As I said to you before, you know, the three bachelor brothers all had sales jobs. Yeah. And the two girls were teachers, teachers. in the Boston public school system. Yeah. As an aside, uh, Aunt May was also principal of the Theodore Parker School, which is down at the end of uh, Church Street and I think it's Church Street, or is it called? No, it's Church Street in West Roxbury, right almost to Center Street mm -hmm. on the corner. And that was uh, grades one through three. Yeah. So for my first three years of uh, schooling, I was sent to Aunt May's school. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was the principal and third grade teacher mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And Alice was at the Patrick London School, mm -hmm. which was in West Roxbury also, but over on off Well Street. Mm -hmm. And Alice taught I third or fourth or fifth grade mm -hmm. elementary school. How many years did she teach? Forever. Do you know? Yeah. yeah. Never, you know, forever. forever. They never had any other job. They went to yeah. normal school, which is called, was teacher's school, mm -hmm. as it's called normal school. And they went right into teaching and never did anything else. Yeah. Both of them. Yeah. And uh, I forget the point I was trying to make about uh, uh, you would ask me about. Uh, well, that's interesting. So when you went to elementary school, uh, uh, May was the principal of the school you were at? Yeah, T uh, principal and teacher. It was and, a small school. And did you have her for third grade? Oh, yes. And uh, the first or second day I was there, I called her Aunt May. <laughs> and she reminded me that her name was Miss Driscoll. <laughs> so I never called her Aunt May at school. <laughs> and how was she as a person with you? That, well, uh, she's, a, she's a school teacher aunt. <laughs> what more can I say? <laughs> I guess you did your homework, huh? <laughs> I, I'm sure I did, or I would have heard about it. <laughs> it's like your relationship with Sean. Right, right. <laughs> Sean and uh, and uh, little Sean go to the same, same school. Did, yeah, up yeah. Up yeah. This year. Yeah. So it was the same kind of deal then. Well, I remember my memory of this family, John H's family, is obviously my grandfather, but I also remember Frank. Oh, yeah. Coming to visit our house in New York. Now, he lived in New York, didn't he? Oh, yeah. <coughs> didn't he live in the city? No, he lived in Mount Vernon. <coughs> he lived at 630 East Lincoln Avenue in Mount Vernon. And that was one of those, obviously, pre-war apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. It's still there. Mm -hmm. With the high ceilings and... Uh, uh, you know, just made to last. Mm -hmm. uh, they're beautiful apartments. Mm -hmm. And he and Bessie never had any children. That mm -hmm. time, he was married to uh, Bessie Lowe, as I said. And uh, Frank, uh, you know, all of our family were in sales in those yeah. days. Yeah. Frank was in the <laughs> silk trade. I didn't know that. Yeah, he was in the silk trade with a, a company that was headquartered in New York called Cheney Silk. Mm -hmm. And uh, Frank did very well there financially and, and worked his way up into that company to, uh, you know, nowadays you'd be called vice president of marketing or executive vice president yeah. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. But he did very well uh, at, uh, at what he did in the soap trade. And uh, 
he was a personality. I mean, you mm -hmm. remember from yes, seeing him. He's yeah. kind of Big round, rotund. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, very, you know, we used to say hail fellow well met, but certainly he was that. Yeah. He was a salesman yeah. and a very, very nice man. And uh, his relationship with his daddy was very strong. And whether it was because they were the only two that married, married. for a long time, or yeah. as I said, Waldo later on married. But Daddy's relationship with Frank was uh, was really a very strong one. You could tell it was a bond there between yeah. these two brothers. And uh, one of my memories uh, as a kid was that uh, Frank <coughs> used to uh, have, get a new automobile every couple of years. That's what I remember. Yeah, and. Uh, he, uh, knowing that Daddy had a slew of kids like he did, and they were getting the age where they were starting to their older brothers were starting to drive and K and so forth. Uh, Frank, when he was about to get a new car, would call Daddy and say, Eddie, are you interested in this Ford that I have or this Buick or whatever? And Daddy would always say yes. <laughs> and uh, so we. We more or less got a new car every two years, depending on uh, Frank's fortunes. <laughs> but the oddball thing about Frank was, yeah, as far as cars are concerned, he always got nice cars, and we got them when they were just two years old, so they were brand new to us. Was that he? He didn't think that heaters belonged in cars. <laughs> he thought you'd go to sleep <laughs> in driving a car with warmth in it. So back in the thirties, uh, a heater in a car was extra money. Yeah. And not that he was chintzy at all, but he just didn't think he should have a heater in a car. Yeah. So we'd get these cars without heaters. <laughs> and sometimes Daddy would have one installed. <laughs> And then, thank God, the automotive industry progressed about it, <laughs> so that they became standard. <laughs> so that concludes the real movie. There were a couple pictures that I couldn't get in during Dad re Dad's reminiscences, so I thought I would do it here. So if you're interested, you can keep watching. At one point in the movie, Dad talked about John H. Driscoll taking classes, and I think he said that John H. Driscoll took classes at the Boston School of Printing, which is what we thought until I called Abby, and Abby looked at the um, drawings in John H. Driscoll's portfolio. This is a picture of John H. Driscoll, uh, another from a work photo that wasn't in the movie. Uh, it's actually a uh, you know a little close up of him from a much larger photograph. But Abby looked at the back of the drawings and saw that each of them is stamped with a stamp from the. Free Evening Industrial Drawing School. Um, and what you're looking at is the course of study that you can find on Google Books. But the Free Evening Industrial Drawing School was a function of the Boston Public Schools and it provided classes at six different locations throughout the city of Boston. And um, right here you can see some photos of the Free Evening Industrial Drawing School. Uh, from the Boston Public Library archives. And unfortunately, none of these pictures were taken at the location that John H. Driscoll took classes at. These are from the other location, so there's no chance that he's in any of these photographs. But what we do know uh, is that he took the his classes at Charlestown, uh, which met at the old city hall in Charlestown. And at the Charlestown location, they offered classes in freehand, machine, architecture and structural drawing, and ship drafting, a three-year course of study in each. There's the stamp that you can see where he wrote, well, where he wrote Charlestown School. So each one was a three-year course of study. And um, sure enough, these drawings to me look very accomplished. We don't know if he finished the course of study or not. And I can't really figure if he took the freehand course of study. It seems like each one was a full three-year course. Or if he took the machine and, or the architectural and structural drawing. In talking about this, we sort of have guessed that this was connected to his work with the water department. That some of his work at the water department 
made this a, a, a good idea, taking these drawing classes. Uh, but we have these sketches that you see, and you'll see some portraiture coming up. Um, and we also have the oil paintings that Dad talked about in the movie. So it seems like he studied drawing for quite some time. In the pictures that you see from the Boston Public uh, Library archives, and those pictures are from the almost the exact same time as his drawings. His drawings were dated 1888. Um, you see people doing head studies in those photographs that look almost exactly like these head studies. In fact, there's one picture that has a woman uh, drawing from a plaster mask, and uh, it looks very, very similar to... Um, what she's working on looks very similar to this uh, sketch by John H. Driscoll. Another thing I wanted to talk about briefly was this. This is uh, from the 1860s census. This is a photograph from the census page. You can see it's stamped over on the side with 9 Harrison Avenue, which I guess is in the north end. And then right here in the middle of the census page, uh, we can see the family of Patrick Driscoll. So it goes Patrick Driscoll, Ellen, Cornelius, John, and William. And you can see that Patrick Driscoll is listed as a laborer, age 35, born in Cork, Ireland. And then if you go down, Ellen is 30 and born in Cork, Ireland. Cornelius, 15 and born in Cork, Ireland. And then John is five years old and born in Boston, Mass. So this is the 1860 census. So that we know that they emigrated before... Um, 1855, and uh, they were in Ireland in 1845 when Cornelius was born. So sometime in between those two dates is when they came to America.